Hello, everyone. Welcome to our live session today. Um, I will be going over a quick starter presentation to welcome you all and introduce you to our program and various opportunities if you have not previously attended our shadowing sessions. I just wanted to say thank you for coming today. Um, today is a celebratory occasion as it's our 100th session. So thank you if you've come to our prior sessions and I look forward to the next 100 with you all. But um, so just a little bit about our program. Pre-Health Shadowing is a student-led, minority-led, woman-led nonprofit dedicated to helping prospective healthcare professionals gain access to education resources, no matter their demographic status, ability, or location. My name is Isaac Thatcher, and I'm the Vice President of Pre-Health Shadowing. Thank you for all attending today, and let's get started. So just a little PSA, we do have closed captioning for all of our students. This setting is available on the bottom of your Zoom screen. And if you need assistance enabling the transcript, please direct message one of our team members who will have a pre-health shadowing background. Uh, we are always looking for ways to be more inclusive and ensure our sessions are accessible to everyone. So please, if you have any recommendations for how we can improve, you could email us at info <coughs> at pre <-health> .com. <laughs> So since this is an international program, we wanna know where are you Zooming from today? Drop it in the chat. I'm calling from Miami, Florida. All over the world. Wow. Singapore, Canada. <laughs> That's awesome. So next up. My chat is in the chat. Oh. Yeah, asked where we were from and no one said Virginia, so I said. So um, if you want to stay in the loop, you can follow us on social media. We're active on Instagram and TikTok or sign up for our email list on our website to never miss a session. We have some wonderful opportunities for you all as benefits being a part of our program. We have partnered with Kaplan to get our students a 10% discount code that can be used on products, as well as free resources such as study guides to help prepare you for standardized tests like the NCAT, GRE, uh, NCLEX, and more. Um, we would also like to draw your attention to Neolith. Neolith is an online mental health platform for students, for pre-health professionals especially. We know the path isn't easy. That's why we have partnered with Neolith to spread the word and offer free access to their services. You can use the link um, and the code PREHEALTH when signing up to get uh, free access. Next up, I would like to bring your attention to Mask for Mask, which is an amazing woman-led organization that donates four masks for every four masks sold. These go to people in need during the COVID-19 pandemic and those in the homeless community, healthcare workers without proper PPE, and others who are struggling to stay safe. With our discount code PHS15, you can get 15% off your order if you buy through this method PREHEALTH shadowing. We'll also get If you want to play a bigger role in pre-health shadowing, we would love for you to join our network of student volunteers and team members. You can apply to be a part of our administrative team, lead students in various products and initiatives. And we understand that as pre-health student, you may not have the time. So we also have to offer the opportunity to volunteer asynchronously for tasks that can be done on your own time. Also, if you're a high school student and want to get involved, we have, a, we have a program called HTP, High School Training for PHS, which allows you to connect with college pre-health programs, get connected in fundraising, and organize resources for other high school students interested in medicine. We want to recognize the hard work of all of our students in the program. So if you're interested in getting published, you could submit essays, reflections, research papers, and reviews to our editor-in-chief the link dropped in the chat below to have your work on our website. This will look great in CVs, applications, resumes, so take advantage of this. Part of our mission at PHS is to promote diversity, and in order to do this, we have launched an initiative to have monthly panels celebrate different de demographics in the field of medicine. Some of these upcoming events include a series on patient experiences, a COVID-19 roundtable, and an international student forum. If you have a mentor, professor, or professional that has inspired you and think could contribute to these conversations, nominate them today using the link in the chat. If you can, we humbly ask that you donate to our program. As you know, Pre-Health Shining is completely student run and we are working around the clock to keep this free and accessible to everyone. Unfortunately, Zoom and our website are not free, so any contrib contribution you can give would be greatly appreciated. 
And if you're not financially able, we request that you just share it with anyone that you know that could possibly donate. And thank you guys. Um, throughout the session today, we encourage you to drop any questions you have for the speaker in the chat. Our team members will be making note of these to be asked in the latter half of the session. Make sure to take good notes as a professional is going over the presentation as there will be the chance to take a post shadowing assessment to verify your virtual shadowing hours. More information will be available on this at the end of the session, so stay tuned. Lastly, if you can, we request that you turn your cameras on. This is by no means an obligation as we are respectful of different circumstances, but it does help us feel closer together in a time when social distancing is mandatory. I appreciate you for listening and now I'd like to welcome Dr. Prudencio. Thank you so much for joining us today. You may share your screen whenever you're ready. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us. Thank you for that introduction. It's very um, smooth program that you guys have going on. So it's a really great organization. Um, nice to see so many people here. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, get started. Um, I'm going to be covering um, my job as a clinical pharmacist in ambulatory care. Um, my uh, background is um, I work in a East Hawaii Health Clinic, which is a Hawaii Island Family Medicine Residency Clinic. So I am a clinical pharmacist by training, um, but I work in a clinic and I primarily educate medical students and medical residents in family medicine. Um, in that position, I'm also a joint, um, joint clinician with the University of Hawaii College of Pharmacy, and I oversee our experiential education program here. So all of the clinical rotations um, are kind of in my jurisdiction here at the college. Um, you can save my contact info if you have any questions later. I'm happy to answer them uh, during this session, um, but you can always email me or you can reach me on my um, pharmacy Instagram. I'm gonna skip this one um, since we kind of already got to ask that in the beginning, it looked like a lot of you guys are from all over the, the country and in other countries as well. Um, I'm physically in Hawaii right now, obviously. Um, so it's only 2 p.m. here. Um, I'm gonna move on to our next one. Uh, obviously my focus is gonna be on pharmacy today, but I am interested to hear what type of healthcare you're interested in. So if you want to go ahead and drop that in the chat, um, obviously my talk will be very relevant to those of you that are pre-pharmacy, but also pre-med, um, pre-nursing, etc. can be very good. Cool, family medicine, neuropsych surgeon, primary care, neuro, nice, okay, good, good mix of things. Um, in clinical pharmacy, my background is specifically primary care, family medicine, um, but I think a lot of it will relate, okay? So getting started, uh, what is clinical pharmacy and how do I get there? Um, a clinical pharmacist is an integral part of the interprofessional and interdisciplinary healthcare team. And our specific role is as the medication expert. Um, so a clinical pharmacist will practice in healthcare settings right alongside other clinicians like physicians and nurses. So rather than practicing in the actual pharmacy, dispensing the medications, um, we're right in the clinic or the hospital or other healthcare setting alongside that team. Um, our goal in all of those settings, though, is to ensure that the meds are optimized to improve patient outcomes. So when we look at a medication regimen, we're really looking at each individual thing, making sure that it's appropriate for that patient, that it's safe for that patient, and that it's effective for the condition that we're treating, right? So those are going to be our three main outcomes. Um, and there's a lot of evidence uh, kind of demonstrating that without the clinical pharmacist, the medications are not as optimized as they could be. Um, so really kind of leveraging that patient-centered approach. Okay. Um, within clinical pharmacy, there's a lot of different um, subtypes. Um, so just like in medicine, there's different types of physicians. Uh, within pharmacy, there's different types of pharmacists as well. Um, there's a lot of different ways to categorize them. 
um, unlike medicine, pharmacy is not as um, delineated um, in our specialties, but in general, most people will categorize clinical pharmacists as either inpatient or outpatient. Um, inpatient being acute care, outpatient being ambulatory care, which is my specialty. And within those settings, there's further specialization, right? So um, if you wanna work in inpatient acute care, you could do ED, ICU, ID, et cetera. Um, and same with outpatient. Some of us focus on peds or geriatrics or cardiology. Um, so there's a lot of different opportunities. So not to try and sway anyone, but if you're interested in these types of fields and you're uh, very interested in the medications, you may wanna consider a career as a clinical pharmacist as well. Okay, um, so what is ambulatory care? Um, when I tell people I'm an ambulatory care pharmacist, a lot of um, people who don't know what that is think I work in the ambulance and I do emergency services, but that is not what I do. Um, ambulatory, right, to ambulate um, is the defining the patient that's able to walk about and not be bedridden, right? Not that they physically have to walk, but we're meaning not admitted to an institution. So anything outpatient setting. Uh, where we work, our clinics, um, the most common practice setting is going to be a patient-centered medical home, or PCMH, which is kind of the move um, in healthcare right now, making sure that we're healthcare homes rather than independent practices, right? So that's going to be most common. Um, there still are some smaller offices, private physicians' offices that will have a pharmacist, um, but we're a lot more common in the larger clinics. And then lastly, we also do telehealth clinics. Um, telehealth Clinical pharmacists have been around for a couple of decades, but in this last year, as you can imagine, telehealth has grown uh, drastically, really quickly. And so that's opening up the field for more uh, opportunities and jobs for clinical pharmacists in telehealth clinics. Okay, um, so how do you become a clinical pharmacist? Um, the pathway, so you go to undergrad, right? Um, for most pharmacy schools, you can actually get your prereqs done within two years if you take a full course load. Um, so a lot of students um, will do that, but majority of students will complete their BA or BS. So most students do get a bachelor's in some kind of science field um, and then apply to pharmacy school. Pharmacy schools are three to four years um, and you earn your doctorate in pharmacy after that. The three-year schools are um, year-round without summer breaks, and the four-year schools typically involve having a summer. Um, so that's the main difference there. After you graduate and pass your licensing exams, they're then a pharmacist, um, and you can work anywhere. But if you want to work in clinical pharmacy, um, you typically have to go to postgraduate residency. Uh, one to two years, depending on your specialty, it is not legally mandated. Um, but pretty much you'll only get hired if you do a residency in these types of fields, or if you can get in um, to a place that you can kind of learn on the job training. So most clinical pharmacists will go through residency as well. Okay, so um, a little bit about myself, um, the way that I got here was I did two years of undergraduate. I was enrolled as a biology major, but I didn't finish my undergrad education um, because I got into pharmacy school. So I became a pharmacist with six years of um, post-secondary education. After I graduated, I did my residency in ambulatory care slash family medicine at UC Davis Medical Center in Sacramento. Um, and then after that, I came back to Hawaii and I've been uh, practicing here as an educator and a clinician for five years now. Okay, um, specialization and board certifications. So this is where um, pharmacy is a little different than medicine. Um, board certification is not required, but like I said, most clinical pharmacists who specialize in these areas typically do obtain board certification. So my credentialing, my official licensed credentialing is no different than the pharmacist um, at CVS or at Walgreens, um, but the specialization and board certifications are optional um, and they help you kind of get jobs in these clinical areas. So my board certifications are as a board certified ambulatory care pharmacist and board certified in advanced diabetes management. Um, 
because that's one of the most common conditions that I, I manage as a pharmacist. Okay, um, why this career? Uh, very similar to anyone else in, anyone else in healthcare. If you're interested um, in helping people, you're fascinated by the sciences, um, then obviously healthcare is correct for you. Specifically pharmacy, if you're interested in medication specifically, uh, pharmacy may be something you want to look into. Um, for me, I wanted to work in ambulatory care because I enjoy working with people and fostering relationships. Um, so I have patients in my clinic that I've known for the last five years um, and have really grown a good professional relationship with them. Um, and we also do a team-based approach. So if you like working with people, meaning patients and uh, colleagues, uh, clinical pharmacy may be a good fit for you. Um, I did want to just throw this um, plug in here. This is the college that I work for. Um, if you're interested in admissions info, you can click there. Our curriculum is based on didactics and experiential rotations. Um, so students in pharmacy school, this is not specific to our school, but really any pharmacy school you would go to, you'll learn the foundational sciences first. So how do the drugs actually work, like scientifically? Um, then you'll learn the clinical therapeutics. So how when you learn how the drug works, how do you then apply it to an actual patient and see how it works in the actual body and then application. So we do a lot of simulation discussions um, and then real patients obviously at the end. Okay. Um, we also have a free resource for anyone um, who is interested that is free to sign up at no charge. Um, it's through core readiness. So you can just click that link and sign up and you can watch some videos about the different fields of pharmacy if you want to. Okay, um, roles and responsibilities. So that's kind of just setting the tone for what clinical pharmacy is, the different types of pharmacist jobs. And now I'm gonna get into actually what I do specifically um, and go over some cases later. So what do I actually do? Um, I provide a service called Comprehensive Medication Management or CMM. Um, so patients come to see me and I work with them to optimize their medications to improve their health outcomes. Uh, my focus is primarily, is, is solely, I should say, on chronic disease states. So um, in our primary care clinic, patients will come to me long term um, to kind of manage those conditions that don't necessarily go away. Um, but I do not see them for acute illnesses, right? So if someone is feeling ill that day and needs to get seen, um, by one of the clinicians, it's typically not going to be a pharmacist, right? That'll be the, the physician, nurse practitioner, or PA. Um, but our focus is going to be long term. Okay. Uh, what I do is I adjust medications, I start new ones, stop old ones, order and interpret labs, and do a lot of educating, uh, motivational interviewing, and coaching patients. Okay. So, um, like I just said, we primarily focus on chronic disease states. So I wasn't really sure where you guys were at. So um, I, I missed the link. I'll share the link at the end of it. I'll, I'll copy it and paste it in the chat. Um, what are some chronic conditions that you think a clinical pharmacist may manage? Just to kind of see where you guys are at. Diabetes, definitely one of the most common ones. Arthritis, yeah, totally. With arthritis, we do a lot of medication management, specifically with the biologics. So a lot of um, newer medications, specifically for rheumatoid arthritis, require a pharmacist uh, counseling and management. Okay, cool. So, what do we do? Um, there are five main uh, duties, categories, I should say, of the pharmacist's job in ambulatory care. Um, the largest one is definitely direct patient care. So being an ambulatory care pharmacist is really exciting because you get to work with patients directly um, and help manage them. Okay, And that's what I'm going to get into most. Um, but I did want to talk about some other things. We do practice management. Um, so we have a patient panel, just like a physician would, of all of their patients that they're responsible for. Um, 
Same thing as a clinical pharmacist. We have the authority to manage our patient population, uh, manage our scheduling. We do have either techs, clerks, or nurses as part of our team that will assist us in doing that. Um, patient advocacy is another big one. So in our underinsured or uninsured populations or fully insured, but just don't have the best coverage, we advocate for them um, to get uh, improved medication access, right? So a lot of people can't afford insulins as you guys have probably heard in the news. Um, so we do a lot of advocacy to make sure that patients have access to all of the things that they need. Um, public and population health, um, my whole last five months have been revolving around COVID vaccinations. Um, so we do a lot of that. Even pre-COVID, you would do that for, you know, flu season, um, pneumonia, et cetera. And then lastly, medical informatics and professional development. Uh, we work very closely with our um, informatics team. So the people who run our electronic medical record, and we give them advice on what workflows would work best in our computer systems to improve patient care. So those are kind of just the little um, tidbits at a glance. Okay, so what conditions, we talked about a couple, right? We, I saw diabetes and um, arthritis, um, heart-related disease and COPD definitely too. So my practice is comprehensive medication management. Um, when you think of that in terms of something you made me more familiar with, think of comprehensive medication management just as you would family medicine or internal medicine, right? So a very broad approach, primary care, taking care of the patient holistically or comprehensively. So that's what I do specifically, um, but other ambulatory care pharmacists may be even more specialized and focused in a certain condition. So I've listed some of them here. This is definitely still not all inclusive but we do have pharmacists who are specialized in geriatrics, oncology, psychiatry, transplant, ID, et cetera. Um, so pretty much any field that involves uh, medications, you can specialize as a clinical pharmacist in that field, right? Um, so all of those would be appropriate depending on the institution that you work at, right? So a larger institution will have a lot more specialized focus areas, uh, whereas smaller institutions will provide more holistic approaches. So what do I actually do during a patient appointment? Um, so this is kind of my little spiel on, on a, a very brief overview of what I do. Prior to the appointment, I'll work up the patient case, right? So I'll re refresh myself on who the patient is, what they're doing, what conditions they have, um, and based on the info that I'm available to get in the electronic medical record, I will come up with some possible plans for that patient, right? So we're going to walk into every appointment having a, a game plan or at least a couple different options on what I think would be most appropriate for them, okay? Um, during the patient appointment, we'll do medication reviews, right? So just because the computer says the patient is taking a medication a certain way doesn't mean that's what's actually happening, right? So we'll make sure that we educate them on that. Uh, my main goal of every first appointment is to make sure that the patient understands what they're taking and why they're taking it, right? Um, you may take medications yourself or have family members or friends, especially our older population, who have 10, 15, 20 medications. A lot of them don't know what they're taking or why they're taking it. Um, and so that's the nice thing that we get to do is sit down and really have them kind of take ownership of their medications, okay? Um, after we kind of gather all that, come up with a game plan as a team, we'll then deliver the care plan. So I'll adjust their medications. Um, in my practice setting, I get to prescribe. So legally as a pharmacist, you are not allowed to prescribe, but in my clinic, we have a setup with a pro uh, progressive collaborative practice agreement where I will prescribe under the physician's license um, in our, our um, agreement, which I have on a later slide. After we do that, um, the patient will be scheduled for a follow-up and then I'll document in the EMR. So this will happen again and again. Right? So the patient will come back to see me again. Um, I am their clinical pharmacist, just as you have a uh, PCP. Um, these patients have a clinical pharmacist on their team. And I'll walk through a little example later too. So this is, um, I think, one of the 
lesser known things of clinical pharmacy are collaborative practice agreements. So through this, um, this is the way that I get to prescribe. So a collaborative practice agreement is with the physician or the medical director um, who will then allow the pharmacist to prescribe under that physician's name and license um, without having to ask them, right? So the physicians that I work with know my expertise and my background, and they're very comfortable with me prescribing under their license without me having to verify that with them. So that's how I practice. Um, it allows clinical pharmacists to really work at the peak of it because um, we are the medication experts. So we're very familiar with whether or not it's appropriate to prescribe. Depending on your practice setting, um, you may have a very uh, progressive collaborative practice agreement or a not a little more focused one. For example, I know some pharmacists that only do diabetes management. And so their collaborative practice agreement specifically allows them to prescribe and edit diabetes medicines, okay? So that will depend on your institution and the providers that you work with, as well as state laws. Um, our uh, collaborative practice agreement also allows me to order labs, imaging, uh, referrals as well. So uh, really allowing me to do anything that any of the other clinicians in our clinic would do. I did wanna say though that uh, CPA is not mandatory, it's just the most progressive thing uh, we do have some clinical pharmacists that will still see the patient, but they're not able to prescribe. Um, in that setting, instead of prescribing, they would then send a note to the physician and kind of let them know their workup, let them know their plan, and then the physician would then accept or deny that recommendation. Okay, so that was kind of where Amcare started, and the CPAs are coming in a lot more uh, commonly now, just because they're a lot more uh, efficient. Okay. Okay, um, I didn't want to bore you guys with data um, and charts, so I just kind of wrote this little summary here. Um, you may think like, why do we need a clinical pharmacist if your clinic has physicians, nurse practitioners, and PAs? What's the benefit of another clinician in that group? Um, there's a lot of evidence out there that shows the benefit of a clinical pharmacist in AmCare has improved outcomes um, for chronic conditions specifically compared to other medical homes without a clinical pharmacist. And so a lot of um, payers are moving towards um, metrics and uh, quality measures. And so having a pharmacist on board uh, will definitely help improve that. And so there's a lot of different ways that that's done from lowering hemoglobin A1Cs and preventing heart attack and stroke to preventing frequent ED visits or rehospitalizations for COPD exacerbations. Um, there's a lot of different evidence out there. So um, happy to chat more about that if anyone has questions. Okay, so that's kind of uh, pharmacy ambulatory care in a nutshell. Um, as far as advice goes for students who are pre-health, I think number one, focusing on your academics. Um, is obviously very important, but I make it a point to let my students know that you really shouldn't overstress on your grades, right? So I'm definitely not saying don't care about them, uh, don't give up on them. You still should, but I hope that when you're learning that your focus is really on acquiring knowledge and skills, not whether or not you got an 84 or 85 or 86, right? So the score doesn't really matter more so, do you understand the info, right? Because whenever you get to whatever health career you're getting to, your grade's not really going to matter as much as can you actually take care of your patient or not, okay? Um, so don't lose sight of that. Um, other than that, as far as getting into pharmacy school or really any other, um, get involved specifically for pre-pharmacy. If you want to join a pre-pharmacy club, um, HOSA is another common one, or other health clubs. It sounds like pre-health shattering is a great one for you guys to do, obviously. Um, for pharmacy, volunteering in a pharmacy, whether it's a hospital pharmacy or a retail pharmacy is also very helpful. Um, there are pharmacy technician and clerk jobs that undergrad students can apply for and get kind of firsthand experience in a retail pharmacy. And then research is always helpful, right? We are a science-based um, profession. So any kind of research or lab experience is definitely gonna help you along the way too. Okay. And then lastly, and probably most importantly is networking. Right, so highly encourage you to take time and figure out if you truly want to pursue 
the career you're interested in and find out if it's a good fit for you. Um, also keep your mind open because you may find other careers such as ambulatory care pharmacy uh, that fits all of your career aspirations and you just didn't really know about it. Um, so ask questions um, and network with you know, your peers and your other resources. Okay, so what does my day typically entail in clinic kind of switching gears? Um, my day is pretty much full of patient appointments. Um, so I get to clinic on my panel, I have patients scheduled from eight to four. Um, I'll see them in clinic or via telehealth. We have both options now. Um, in between patients, I also get a lot of consults from um, MD, DOs, NPs, RNs, and we also have a clinical um, psychologist in our clinic too. So they'll do warm handoffs or consults with me all day um, about their patients and vice versa, right? I'll ask them, I'll have a patient that comes in in something a little outside of my scope and I'll have to go ask the physicians as well. So it's really a, a two-way street, yeah. Um, I do a lot of interprofessional education as well. So my faculty position is in the College of Pharmacy, but we are closely linked with the College of Medicine on Oahu. And so I do a lot of education to our med students and to the medical residents in my clinic, um, precepting them on their pharmacotherapy rotations. Population health management, when there is downtime, um, will ensure that our entire patient population is uh, as good as possible. Med access, so again, lobbying with insurance companies and payers to make sure that patients have access to their meds. Um, is probably one of the most frustrating things of the job, but probably the most rewarding as well, right? When you can actually make a difference and someone's happy uh, financially and um, physically, right? Then lastly, we do a lot of quality improvement projects. So making sure that um, our other providers and ourselves are up to date, that our practices are top line and inclusive of the most uh, newest evidence and medications. So that's pretty much it. Um, Wednesdays today uh, is our admin day. So Wednesdays we do close um, at noon, which is why I was able to be here at two. Um, but on other days, it's pretty much a 7.30 to five day. So I get to clinic at 7.30. I'm gonna review my patients for the day. Um, our clinic does a group huddle with everyone at 7.50. From eight to 12, I see patients. My patient appointments are blocked in 20 to 40 minutes, um, depending on the complexity. So this is one of the other benefits of having a clinical pharmacist versus just a physician run practice is that we're additional help, right? So our physician panels are probably about, I think 1500 patients for each physician, uh, whereas our pharmacist panels are usually like 300, right? Um, because the patients who are more complex really need us. And so we have more time to spend with the patient because we're really focused on the meds, whereas other clinicians are really focused on everything as a whole, right? They have to do so many different things that they can rely on us to focus specifically on the meds and spend a lot of time with the patients. So we get to spend up to 40 minutes with a patient if we really need to teach them about the meds. Uh, we precept pharmacy students, med students, and med residents throughout those visits. And then, like I said, handoffs and consults between patients. Um, one of the good thing about outpatient is we do have a fairly uh, structured schedule. So we do get a lunch break, um, but those lunch breaks pretty much always just documenting because clinic overflows. And then after lunch, we'll do patient appointments for the rest of the afternoon too. So my whole clinic day is pretty much patient appointments and answering questions. Okay. Just stop there. So um, I have one patient case example um, that is a very simplified example of a patient scenario. Um, one, I wanted to try to give you guys a glimpse of what we actually do, but I didn't want to overcomplicate it without you knowing kind of some background knowledge. Um, so this is my attempt at it, okay? Um, this is a disclaimer, like I said, the the answers to these cases are going to be oversimplified just because you can't really fit everything um, in a 15 minute kind of case talk. Um, everything's going to be very patient specific um, and there's going to be a lot more factors to consider. So what I'm going to talk about here um, is this 
fake patient, but it's really a, a, an edited real patient. Um, a 55 year old male that comes to see me referred by their PCP for comprehensive medication management. They have a past medical history of type two diabetes, hypertension, heart failure, dyslipidemia and gout. We have five meds on board. We have some labs and vitals listed there. And so I, again, didn't really know what kind of background knowledge you guys have. So if you wanna just take a stab at it in the chat, do any of you know any of these five medications or any of the labs and vitals? and we can talk about them. It's okay if you don't. Any wild guesses too? Uh, safe environment, so feel free to just guess even if you have no clue. Okay. No takers? Okay. I'm gonna walk through each of them, okay? Um, so allopurinol is our first medication listed there. That is a xanthine oxidase inhibitor. Okay, we got some guesses. Good, good. Second medication, atorvastatin, is actually for cholesterol. Um, so atorvastatin is a group of medications called statins, correct, um, but they're not for hypertension. They're actually for hyperlipidemia or dyslipidemia. So statins um, are the common phrase, their medical uh, group class is HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors. So those of you who are in biochem, you guys might have learned that kind of pathway for cholesterol synthesis. HMG-CoA is that rate limiting enzyme step um, in the production of cholesterol. So that's how statins work. Um, Going back to allopurinol, that's a xanthine oxidase inhibitor, right? So you guys remember um, xanthine oxidase from biochem as well, right? Anytime anything ends in ACE or ASE, that's an enzyme, right? So xanthine, xanthine oxidase is an enzyme that catalyzes uric acid production. And so allopurinol stops excessive uric acid from being built up, which then helps control gout. Um, third, yeah. Third medication is for blood pressure. So lisinopril is an ACE inhibitor, uh, meaning angiotensin converting uh, enzyme. So that stops angiotensin II from being made, which works in our renin angiotensin aldosterone pathway. So with this specific patient, lisinopril is for hypertension, um, but it is also helping uh, manage the patient's heart failure. So it's really doing two things, uh, hypertension and heart failure, which commonly go hand in hand, okay? And then correct, metformin is used for type two diabetes. So that is that fourth medication there. Metformin is our uh, standard of care for first line for type two diabetes. Um, I'll talk more about metformin later. And then the last one is metoprolol succinate. Um, that is a beta blocker specifically beta-1. Does anyone know where our beta-1 uh, beta receptors are? Maybe in human A and P, you guys are learning that. So our beta-adrenergic receptor is subtype 1. Our beta receptors are in our heart. Yeah, good, heart. So, um, Beta, right? So beta adrenergic receptors are part of our sympathetic system. And so epinephrine, norepi, all of that will hit on your beta uh, receptors. There's beta one and beta two. You can remember them. If you haven't taken ANP yet, I'll help you out right now. Uh, beta one is in your heart, beta two is in your lungs, right? Because you have one heart and two lungs, okay? so. Always remember your beta-1 receptors are in your heart, your beta-2 are in your lungs because of that, that's how many organs you have, okay? Um, beta receptors, when epinephrine hit them in our heart, it'll cause an uh, increase in our heart rate, so it causes the heart to beat faster. Um, and in patients with heart failure or hypertension, their heart rate is frequently high. And so by blocking the epinephrine um, stimulation of the beta-1 receptors, we then lower the heart rate. And as you lower the heart rate, you then lower the blood pressure, right? Um, so that's how that medication works kind of in, in 
overview. Okay. I saw someone say hemoglobin A1C is the blood glucose, and that's correct. Good. So hemoglobin A1C is our glycated um, hemoglobin cells or our red blood cells. Um, it's correlated to blood glucose, but it's not exactly the same. So hemoglobin A1C tells us the average of blood glucose floating around in the body over the last three months or so, because the hemoglobin A1C lasts for about 90 to 120 days. Uh, whereas your blood glucose is really just gonna be a point in time. Okay. Good. Um, running through the rest of them, EGFR is estimated glomerular filtration rate. That tells us how much the kidneys are functioning. Um, this is a lipid panel, so total cholesterol, um, low density lipoproteins or bad cholesterols, high density lipoproteins or high cholesterol, or good cholesterol, and then triglycerides. And then AST and ALT are our liver functions. Okay, any questions on that? Okay. Um, so just running through what I would actually do with this patient um, in kind of a simplified manner. The first step that I would do is a medication reconciliation, meaning the computer is telling me the patient is taking these five medications, um, but I wanna know if that's actually true, right? So is the patient actually taking them? Are they taking them correctly uh, with food or without food? What time they're taking it? Making sure all of that's correct. What I also do is compare their problem list or their medical history with their medication list and make sure that everything matches, right? So if I have a patient taking allopurinol, I wanna make sure that they're also diagnosed with gout, right? It needs to match or else then we have a, a gap and a problem, okay? Um, I'll also look backwards. So I'll look at all of the medication or the um, medical problems and identify if they're being treated with a medication, right? So this patient has type 2 diabetes, treated with metformin, hypertension and heart failure, lisinopril and uh, metoprolol, dyslipidemia, atorvastatin, and gout is allopurinol, right? So if I saw the patient was diagnosed with gout and they're not on allopurinol, that'll flag me and I'll know I have to assess where, whether or not that gout is appropriately controlled since there's no meds, okay? So step one is always a medication reconciliation. Um, that is common with any clinician. So that's not just pharmacy. Um, medicine, nursing, et cetera, is also gonna do that. Um, the next step I would do is gather some additional information, right? So social history, diet, exercise, yeah. A lot of these lifestyle facts affect patients' chronic conditions. So I wanna know more about them before I just adjust their meds. Right? So although my focus is on meds, we are still treating the patient as a patient, not as a random case. Yeah, So we get to know them, make sure that the plan is going to be specific for that individual. Okay, um, the next step I would do is assess their conditions and prioritize, right? Because again, I'm providing comprehensive management of their medications. So this patient has five diagnosed conditions. And based on the labs and what I find out from them, I need to prioritize them in urgency and severity in order to create my plan. Because I'm not gonna do everything all at once, right? If, how would you feel if you went to the doctor's office and then you left with five new medications all in one day, right? Very overwhelming. Um, so instead we're gonna prioritize and uh, come up with a plan. So based on our labs here, the two most important things that I would want to tackle are going to be our blood glucose and blood pressure. Okay. Anyone know what a normal blood pressure is for someone without hypertension? The average blood pressure, good, 120 over 80, perfect. Um, now, when someone's diagnosed with hypertension, do you guys know what our general treatment goals would be? So let's say someone has a really high blood pressure and I am aiming to treat it, do you know how low we want it to get? Okay, so depending on their comorbidities, meaning other um, problems, we'll wanna treat their blood pressure to a goal of either less than 140 over 90 um, or less than 130 over 80, there you go, good. 
So for this patient, because they're a little more complicated, right? They have diabetes, they have heart failure, uh, a lot of cardiac comorbidities. I would want their blood pressure to be less than 130 over 80. So today in our clinic, um, our patient's blood pressure is 150 over 90, which is you know 20 over 10 higher than I want it to be. So that's going to be a high priority for me today. Okay. Um, what about hemoglobin A1C? This one's probably less commonly known, but do you guys know what the normal range is of an A1C? Um, it's like 6.5. In patients without diabetes, it should be less than 6.5. Okay. Um, we consider it pre-diabetes when it's above 5.7. So someone without diabetes or prediabetes, the normal is less than 5.7. Um, diagnosis of type 2 diabetes is when A1C is greater than 6.5. And this patient's A1C is 9.2. Okay. Um, so our goal for this patient is to have it less than 7, maybe less than 6.5. So that's very, not very high, but it is high. And so that's why we would target those two today. Right? So blood glucose and blood pressure. So then after identifying the problems that I want to address, I would then come up with a medication plan. Um, and the way that I look at things is making sure everything's optimized, right? So appropriate, safe, and effective. But I also think about the patient's pill burden and quality of life, right? Um, majority of patients, if they can have less medications, that's better for them, right? So for this specific patient, I would start them on a diabetes medication that is a sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitor or SGLT2 inhibitor. This type of medication is very beneficial in patients with diabetes and heart failure. So this is an example of where I would be prescribing a medication that is um, one medication, but used for two conditions really, right? So kind of getting that optimal approach. Like I said, we would want to target an A1C of less than 7%. Um, and the way that this medication works is it decreases glucose reabsorption in the proximal tubule of your nephron, right? So with type 2 diabetes, um, the kidneys do filter some glucose. Um, but with type 2 diabetes, it gets frequently reabsorbed back into the blood from the urine. SGLT2 inhibitor blocks that reabsorption. So then essentially the patients are urinating out glucose, the excess glucose. So that's how that medication works. Okay. Um, being that their blood pressure is high, I would also want to increase their lisinopril. So lisinopril is a medication, like I said, that is good for heart failure and high blood pressure. Um, again, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor. So it's blocking the formation of angiotensin 2 which then blocks aldosterone, uh, which then lowers blood pressure. Okay. And like I said, our blood pressure goal, um, good job whoever said that, our blood pressure goal for this patient would be less than 130 over 80. Okay. So those would be the two medication plans that I'd adjust today. Um, so I would go through it with them, talk to the patient about why we're doing it, what we're doing and what they can expect, uh, meaning any types of side effects and self-monitoring just so that they really understand what we're doing and can trust in the process too. Okay. And then lastly, I would follow up. So I would order necessary labs. So based on the medications I would change, I probably want to check their kidneys again, check their potassium because of the aldosterone, um, order the prescriptions, and then I'd have the patient come back to see me in two weeks to a month. And then at that visit, we'd start all over again um, with the new, new regimens, right? But that's kind of the process that we would take for this patient. Any questions? Okay, um, I just have two more slides and then we can just do any, any broad Q&A you guys have. Um, I wanted to just talk a little bit about diabetes. Um, in pharmacy school, we teach diabetes pharmacotherapy um, for I think 15 hours is our uh, lecture time and then a lot of case-based application. Um, but I'm gonna give it to you in three slides, just kind of the very basic. Hopefully this will help you in your future career slash if you take AMP, uh, pathophys, anything like that, hopefully this will be helpful. 
So you guys all probably know type two diabetes, the problem is high blood glucose, right? Um, the reason patients have type two diabetes or high blood glucose in type two diabetes is really through eight different potential mechanisms. Um, so kind of walking through our pancreas has alpha cells and beta cells. Um, in type two diabetes, the beta cells don't produce as much insulin um, and the alpha cells uh, produce more glucagon. Does anyone know what glucagon is? The antagonist to insulin. Yeah, good. Right, so that's going to produce more glucose, right? And that's why they're not having insulin and they're doing too much glucagon, um, right? So that's why that's happening. Um, number three, the liver increases hepatic gluconeogenesis. You guys learn about that? gluconeogenesis, right? So if you kind of break down that, that term, uh, gluconeogenesis, meaning the production of glucose, right? So the liver is producing more glucose naturally. Um, kidney, we talked about that one already. It's increasing glucose reabsorption. Um, number five, muscle cells are uh, having increased resistance to insulin. So not only is the pancreas not producing enough, but what is being produced, the body is not responding to it as well. Um, number six, there's a lot of lipolysis involved in the fat cells of the body, um, you know, leading to the production of over, over glucose. Um, number seven, the stomach decreases incretin effects, um, causing us to not metabolize our food as well, leading to higher blood glucose and also overeating um, through neurotransmitter dysfunction in the brain. So the incretins are supposed to trigger our brain to tell us we are full when we have enough glucose from the food, um, but that can be dysfunctional in type two diabetes leading to excessive overeating, um, more weight gain and kind of a, a cyclical process. Okay, so um, the reason I'm highlighting diabetes is because I think as, at least when I was in undergrad, I didn't think about it this way, I just thought, Diabetes is high blood sugar, and that's the problem. Um, but what we really want to get to the focus of it uh, when you get into your healthcare careers is understanding the pathophys, so then you know how to create a game plan, right? So there's eight different ways that um, type 2 diabetes occurs. Um, and because of that, we have a handful of different medications that all work in different ways, right? To kind of tag team and target all of those different approaches. So. I'm not going to go into all of these um, just because I think, I don't know, you can ask questions if you have questions about them. Um, but you can see here, some of these drugs work in the liver, some of them work in the pancreas, some of them work through our fat cells and our stomachs um, and in the kidneys. So we have a lot of different medications depending on uh, their approach. And so we would use all of this information to come up with a plan for that specific patient. Um, to get to the root of the problem. Okay. I have this question here. Um, this is going to be my last slide, but just to kind of start the Q&A part, do you guys know the complications of uncontrolled type 2 diabetes? Blindness can be one, yeah. So damage to the nerves, the retinal nerves, which can then lead to blindness or decreased vision. Tissue necrosis is definitely one. Um, impaired wound healing because of that, which then can lead to amputations. Um, seizures, yeah, um, more acutely, it wouldn't be chronic seizures, but yeah, if someone goes into diabetic ketoacidosis, um, they could cause seizures. Heart disease is gonna be one of our number one chronic problems, okay? Good, any others? So, Weight gain, yep, definitely. Weight gain, and then unfortunately the weight gain then worsens diabetes, and so that's that cyclical approach. Um, so when we look at complications, we're really looking at macrovascular and microvascular. Good, kidney disease, yep, right? A lot of patients with diabetes, if uncontrolled, um, can lead to end-stage renal disease, and then they're on dialysis. Um, and then, yeah, diabetes is associated with increased risk of dementia if uncontrolled. 
So good. I think you guys covered all of them, actually. Main ones, heart disease, heart attack, and stroke. So I think we didn't talk about stroke, but stroke is really heart attack and stroke are always kind of lumped together because of that pathway. And then our microvascular complications um, being kidney disease, um, tissue necrosis kind of related to um, decreased uh, feeling or increased nerve damage in the periphery, which can then lead to foot infections and amputations and um, changes in vision we already talked about. Okay. Um, so with that, I'll kind of close out, um, answer any questions if you have them. Um, and there's my contact information, my email, and uh, my work Instagram. Thank you so much, Dr. Prudencio. Um, I really personally learned a lot. Um, I'm a pre-med student, but um, maybe after this presentation, I'll switch to pre-pharmacy. <laughs> But um, so we had a couple questions in the chat. Um, so the first question, I guess I could start off. Um, it deals with how has medicine changed you? Um, and how do you um, handle like the work-life balance um, with your prospective career? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think medicine has definitely changed me um, in great ways. I think I, uh, matured a lot. Well, not that I was immature, but just as you become a clinician, you have a lot of responsibilities, right? Um, so I think that has kind of evolved my, my personal life. As far as work-life balance, that's something I stress with all of my students. Um, and I'll stress to you guys too, because I know how much pressure you're probably feeling as you're pre-med, pre-health, pre-nursing, whatever it is. Make sure that you, you take self-care time. Um, that's obviously easier said than done. Um, but it is really important because hopefully you guys have decades of, you know, your career ahead of you and you don't want to burn out before you even start. Right. So make sure that you, you do that. Um, I use Google Calendar for everything, um, including time when I'm not working. Right. So as an academic person, I have students as well that, you know, will be uh, emailing me or um, DMing me and I have blocked out time that I'm just unplugged. You can't reach me and it's scheduled on my Google Calendar, which I get it's ironic because I'm relying on technology to unplug. But I think when you are very intentful in your scheduling, I think that's that's a way to avoid burnout because um, I want to practice for a long time more um, and I don't want to get tired of it. So I think I think that's that's the big one definitely good to have a good work-life balance because you don't want to be too stressed because that will affect the way that you deliver care. Um, so we had another question that um, was asked in the chat. Was there anything that um, when you were an undergraduate student going into uh, pharmacy school, um, was there anything that you didn't expect going into pharmacy? Yeah, um, I didn't expect to end up, I guess I didn't share this part of my background as well, but I didn't expect to uh, be a clinical pharmacist. I went to school to be a, uh, with the intent to be a, a retail pharmacist, uh, meaning working at the pharmacy, uh, because I had no idea this existed. So I had no idea that pharmacists worked in this capacity. Um, and when I got into pharmacy school, I found that that was what I wanted to do after the fact. Um, so that's why I encourage everyone to look at all of your options ahead of time, um, just because the sooner you find out you like something or don't like something, um, the better, you know. Um, I changed my career path a couple of different times in pharmacy school. I went from wanting to be a retail pharmacist, and then I wanted to do critical care up until my last year. Um, I begged my... Uh, rotation director at the time to give me all these critical care ICU rotations. Um, and my first two blocks were neuro, uh, neuro ICU, and then my second was PEDS ICU. And just for me and my personality, I found out that wasn't a great fit um, because I enjoy working with people and talking to patients. And in the ICU, you don't get to talk to a lot of patients, unfortunately, because they're not, you know, at the, the time to be uh, talking with them and you don't get to see them long term. And so 
I think the more you explore, and I think as you guys are here on your own free time uh, doing these health shadowings, I think you're getting some glimpses into careers that you may not have thought about um, or reinforcing what you're already interested in. So um, that's what I at least expected, I think. I think I didn't picture being here. So. That was a great answer. Um, we had a question on case one uh, that you presented um, in your yeah. presentation. It was asked by Nikita, and she asked um, if metformin, uh, the medication, is used to treat type 2 diabetes. Yes, it is. So um, it is used to treat type 2 diabetes. It uh, decreases um, the body's insulin resistance. It decreases the um, gluconeogenesis in the liver. Um, so it works in a couple different ways to lower blood glucose. Uh, metformin is also used in um, something called PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome um, because there is a level of insulin resistance associated um, in PCOS. So those are the two things that metformin is used for. Thank you. Thank you so much for the clarification. Um, so um, if you were not to go into a healthcare career, um, what would you picture yourself doing otherwise? I can't see myself doing anything else right now, to be honest. Um, but I'll take the, the cop-out answer and say teaching. Um, I say that's a cop-out because I'm also teaching in my job right now. Um, but I, I love talking to people. Um, and I think that's the next best thing outside of healthcare is probably I don't want to teach um, to help the next generation. But I, I couldn't see myself doing anything else right now. Yeah, definitely pharmacy is the way to go. Yeah. So um, regarding like the day-to-day -day life about um, your job, what's like the most rewarding or the most favorite part that um, you obtain like each day? Like, is it your patients? Is it the experiences with other healthcare professionals? Um, yeah, um, I think it's both in different ways. Um, I think the number one uh, most rewarding thing is, is improving patients' lives. Um, and in ambulatory care, family medicine, primary care, outpatient, um, you're not really saving anyone's urgent life from right now, right? Versus in emergency medicine and ICU. Um, but it's nice seeing them progress. And when you reflect back with them on how much weight they've lost over the last year or how they substantially decreased their risk of heart attack or they've successfully quit smoking because of the you know, uh, medications you're able to help them with um, and just be happier and more energetic. I think those are probably the number one most rewarding things is seeing the patient's impact. Um, and the number two, I think, is just getting to work with, with clinicians. We all come from different uh, trainings, the nurses or psychologists or physicians, and me and the other pharmacists. Um, I think it's a really nice team and it's good to have different perspectives. You know, I think that's really rewarding. I learn a lot from them and they learn a lot from me. And it's just so, you gotta get used to never stopping learning. If you're looking forward to graduating and then never learning again, uh, you're sadly mistaken in healthcare. But you're gonna learn forever, so be ready. Thank you so much. Um, we had another question from Kamsha. Uh, she asked, what is the most mem memorable case or moment that you had in your practice? Oh, that's a great question. Two come to my mind immediately. I'm sure there are others. Um, one of the things that I've started doing this past year is um, providing medication management specifically for hepatitis C, patients with hepatitis C, um, which so hepatitis C is a virus, um, it's a form of hepatitis that affects the liver. It is chronic in the sense that it's long-term, 
but hepatitis C is one of the only conditions that is chronic that you, you can actually cure, right? So with diabetes and high blood pressure, we don't use the term cure because patients live with type 2 diabetes forever. It can be managed and they can have no complications from it, but the underlying problems are always there. Whereas with hep C, you can actually cure someone and eradicate it from the body. Um, and so I remember my very first hep C patient who after months of therapy um, on this new medication, previously years ago have been on old medications that didn't work. Um, I remember the day that I got to tell them that they were cured of hep C and that their liver returned to normal function, uh, which was probably one of the most exciting things. Um, so that's one. The number two, I think anytime I work with a, a pediatric patient with type one diabetes after their first diagnosed, um, we didn't really talk about type one diabetes today, but uh, for those of you that don't know, type one diabetes is an autoimmune condition where the pancreas essentially attacks itself and kills the pancreatic beta cells. So there's no uh, insulin production. So most people with type one diabetes find out because they end up hospitalized because um, they have no other risk factors, their sugar just goes up to the 600s and they end up in the hospital, um, which can be a very life-altering event. Um, but seeing patients after they get the grasp of it and they get a continuous glucose monitor, like the one that Nick Jones advertises on TV, where they get an insulin pump um, and really take control of their lives and feel empowered, I think is probably one of the best things. So hopefully you guys have a lot of those types of experiences. I, I could go on and on, um, but I think those are the two that I immediately think about. That's a great response. And especially since, as you mentioned previously, um, pharmacists have more like direct contact, like they have longer time spent with the patient. So I, you definitely like get more memorable experiences, I'm sure. Um, so we had a question that kind of relates to your location. It was asked about Rohan. He asked, what made you want to come back to Hawaii after your residency year at UC Davis? Oh, okay, that's a good question. That's just a um, personal. For me, I'm, I'm from Hawaii. And so I grew up here, it's my home. Um, I enjoyed California a lot. Um, but for me, part of the reason that I wanted to practice in healthcare was to take care of my community specifically. Um, in Hawaii, we're one of the most diverse places. So, um, you know, it's cool to see you guys are a minority run. Um, one of the things you guys mentioned. Because um, in Hawaii, our traditional minority populations are the majority here. Um, and everyone's mixed. Um, we frequently don't know each other's ethnicities because a lot of us are just mixed with everything. Um, it's just a different culture. Um, environment and you know you could say the same of any any other culture but uh, that's what I'll say about Hawaii and so I was happy to be back and kind of take care of the community that took care of me um, be closer to my family and friends and so that's that's why I came back um, but Davis was great I have a lot of friends still in SAC um, and I would enjoy working there too it's just for me personally I'm from Hawaii and that was my home so I came back Definitely, I'm in I'm in Illinois, so it's definitely a lot warmer in Hawaii. <laughs> I sure wish I was there. Um, but um, regarding like diversity and inclusion, um, do you consider your profession as more diverse and inclusive of minorities than other medical professions out there? It's a good question. I've never thought about it in that context. I I think we're very uh, inclusive um, profession in a diverse one. I don't know that we're more diverse or inclusive than any others. Um, I think one of the good things about pharmacy is that we have a lot of career pathways. Um, but like I had mentioned earlier, there's no clear delineation. So if I wanted to go get trained to work in the ICU, um, I could without having to go back to school or go back to residency. Um, or I could go work at CVS if I wanted to, too, and vice versa. You know, there's a lot of switching, whereas I think in um, a lot of the other provider fields, you kind of choose your specialty, and then you're in that specialty until you, you know, if you want to change, you can go 
redo residency or fellowship or whatever it is. Um, but I think there's a lot of you know, uh, navigating pathways. Um, but as far as diversity and inclusion, I think I don't think we're more than any others, but I don't think we're I think we're doing okay. Yeah. I think statistically, there are a lot more uh, women in my profession than males. It's very interesting. Um, so um, since I am a pre-medicine student, um, and you mentioned a couple courses like anatomy and physiology as well as biochemistry, um, are there any courses out there um, for pre-pharmacy students or pre-medicine students uh, for them to like take or that you would recommend taking prior to attending pharmacy school or as well as medical school? Yeah, I think those two would be the big ones. I think personally, I think A&P or if you have a pathophysiology course, um, obviously you learn some patho in regular physiology, but um, if your college offers a pathophysiology course and it's not a part of your curriculum that you have to take, I would recommend taking that as an elective. Um, for the, just to make sure everyone's on the same page, pathophysiology is when our physiology goes wrong, right? So all of the diseases and the pathways to causing those diseases. Um, I didn't take that in undergrad. I took regular um, A&P, but I think A&P and pathophysiology really will set the tone for any healthcare field, uh, medicine, nursing, PT, you know, everything, because you just need to know what's happening with the body. No matter what field you go in, you need to know that first before you can fix it in your practice, right? So I'd say that. Um, if your college offers an undergrad pharmacology course, like an intro to pharmacology, um, I'd recommend that too, um, no matter what field you're going into again. Obviously, I'm trying to sway all of you to, to join pharmacy, but um, if you join anything else, you still need to know basic pharmacology, right? In nursing school, you'll learn pharmacology in med school. Um, my brother is in physical therapy school, and he has pharmacology, even though PT is traditionally not really related to meds. Um, so no matter what healthcare field you're going to go into, you need to know some basic pharmacology. So if there are, I know some colleges have that as undergrad courses. Um, so if it's available to you, I would recommend that. And um, this is just a general question um, that I had. Um, so I know for medical school, um, you will take the MCAT. Um, what is the like standardized test for pharmacy school? Is it the GRE? It's the PCAT. So it's, it's exactly like the MCAT, it's just P for pharmacy instead of M for medicine. Um, but I will say a lot of pharmacy schools do not require the PCAT anymore. Um, there was just a little bit of controversy about the correlation of performance scores behind that and, and success in pharmacy school. So a lot of schools don't require it, um, but that is the test that you would take. We don't, I don't know if any pharmacy school that actually would look at GRE or anything else. Um, most are just PCAT and GPA and general application. Um, and then I think no matter what field you guys go into too, you'll, you'll work with a lot of people. Um, all of the healthcare professions, accrediting bodies have joined together and we implement a lot of interprofessional education. Um, so our pharmacy students here work with the med students on Oahu and the nursing students. Um, our social work school and we have a diet, dietetic uh, program. And so all of those students have a cohort together where they learn together certain classes. Um, and I think that's pretty standard at all universities now. So you guys have that to look forward to. Yeah, I definitely didn't know like pharmacy schools don't look at the PCAT as much, which I mean, that could sway someone to who's a bad test taker to want to go into pharmacy school because like, I'm, I'm pretty bad at standardized tests myself, but. <laughs> We'll, we'll cross the bridge when that MCAT gets here. But um, so this is relating 
to, I guess, like um, studying habits that you had as an undergraduate student. Um, was there any like, uh, like favorite songs that you would play to motivate yourself or like, like how to stressful activities or stressless activities that you would do um, to, I guess, like handle the intensive coursework that you had? Yeah, um, my study habits, I would watch a lot of Netflix while I studied, um, meaning like background Netflix, right? So shows that you're not really invested in, but you have some background noise, not even really paying attention to it. Um, that's what I would do. That was, I don't know why that always worked for me. Um, dead silence really just would not be productive to me specifically studying. So I'd never study in a library or anything like that. Um, I need that kind of ambient noise. So that was my study habit throughout undergrad and pharmacy school. Um, I would also like read slides um, in the gym on a bike or on the treadmill, not running, just walking the, the Stairmaster, you know? Um, just because then I feel like I'm doing something. For me, I have a lot of just built up energy that I need to get rid of to study. And so those are the, the, the ways of how I study. Um, I think it's pretty common. I don't have any good unique tips to share. Thank you so much for that. Um, this is a question that was from Lauren that just came in the chat. Um, she asked, what would you recommend to someone who is swaying between becoming a physician or becoming a clinical pharmacist? Ooh. It's a good question. Um, I think the main difference, and I, I talk with my med residents about this all the time, is what you're really, really interested in. Um, I think if the medications, um, the medication aspect of treatment is most interesting to you, then clinical pharmacists would be the way. Um, if you're really interested in a more holistic approach and kind of being the uh, you know, end of kind of the, the team lead essentially, um, then you'd want to be a physician. Um, so, right, I'm not going to do any type of diagnosing, differential diagnoses, um, conversations about, you know, hospice care, family planning, um, urgent visits, all of those things are outside of my scope, right? And so, if physicians are going to be that's going to be your uh, main difference, I think. Um, that's pretty much all I would say. Uh, and that's caveat. I'm talking about family medicine specifically for physicians, right? Obviously, if you want to do surgery or, um, you know, neurology or anything like that, it's a different conversation. But when you're talking family medicine physician versus clinical pharmacist, um, I think those would be the the approaches. Then I also think realistically you should think about your, your path um, and what you're invested into getting. Not that becoming a clinical pharmacist is easy by any means, but the pathway can be a lot shorter um, to get there, right? Um, but then the difference is as well, we don't have prescriptive authority on our own licenses. Um, we do not bill for our services. So our cost saving comes from patient outcomes rather than direct billable visits. Um, I can't open up my own practice or anything like that, right? Versus a physician you could. Um, so I think those are kind of the, the pros and cons to think about. I think at the end of the day, again, if the medications are really what interests you and like you wanna treat all these conditions through meds, um, I would look into pharmacy. We work super close together too. So whichever one you pick, you're gonna work with the other one. So we just got another question in the chat. Um, so with the ongoing opioid crisis, um, there is a movement against direct pain reduction medications. Um, so based on your perspective, how does that look like through the pharmacist's um, viewpoint? Um, like what treatments are um, considered like supplemented? Yeah, so I definitely, for 
for me, opioids are going to be our last line or use an acute pain, um, you know, because obviously if someone's in acute pain, you need an opioid. But opioids are really not effective for chronic pain. Um, just again, going back to your pathophysiology of what is the pain, the chronic pain, um, what is causing the chronic pain, opioids are not going to treat that, right? So uh, from the pharmacist perspective, that's my point of view and kind of reasoning of if I'm going to treat something with a medication, I need to know that it's actually working and treating the root cause. So that's why opioids will not work. Um, as far as other treatments, um, we look at when we talk pain, there's different types of pain. And a lot of people have that I see have neuropathic pain um, being mistreated by opioids. So we'll use um, serotonin, norep uh, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors or GABA analogs to treat um, the pain if it's neuropathic, um, NSAIDs, things like that. Um, but really the move to combat the opioid crisis is gonna be taking the holistic approach, which is outside of my scope. So that's the physicians, but um, rehab, physical rehab and non-pharmacotherapy approaches are gonna be the most effective long-term. So that's what I encourage uh, with all of my patients is I let them know there's no magic pill. Um, so opioids are not a magic pill, it's not gonna work. Um, my role though is not necessarily from the prevention of prescribing it, because I never prescribed them, um, but more so on the focus of using naloxone. Um, hopefully you guys all know about naloxone. If you don't, um, it is a medication that is used to treat opioid um, overdoses. Um, and there's a big push that um, everyone should be trained on how to use naloxone. So if that's not something you know how to do, um, Google it real quick later. Um, there's all these certification courses, it'll take you like an hour, but it's just like how you should know how to use an EpiPen if you know someone that has an allergy. Same thing with naloxone, just a little spray in the nose or a jab to the leg, but save lives. That's very interesting, thank you. Um, and we have room for one more question um, before um, we wrap it up. Um, so this question was from Kamsha. She asked, did you know that you wanted to do pharmacy early on in your life? Um, yes and no. Um, I, I didn't share this part of my story either. I kind of accidentally fell into pharmacy. So um, a little personal background too. Um, when I was in high school, my uh, parents had an agreement that they would purchase a car for me, not a, nothing fancy, just like it's, you know, used car, um, if I was able to pay for my own gas and everything that comes with a car. And so I started looking for a job and my health teacher knew of an independent pharmacy in town that was looking for a, uh, they called it a clerk, but it was really like a trash boy that would just carry things and take out trash and mop floors. Um, in a pharmacy. And so that's how I, I started working there when I was 16. Um, and from there, I was kind of saw what was happening around the store, got interested, and then I became a technician um, and then wanted to go into pharmacy. So I really just, it kind of worked out just magically, I guess. Um, but prior to that, I had no interest in pharmacy. Um, but at that time, I also was not really thinking about my future. When I was 16, I don't know, some of you guys are probably a lot more um, proactive than me, but I was not thinking about what I wanted to be. I was just enjoying myself. So, um, happenstance kind of worked out for me. And yes, correct. Narcan is brand name for Naloxone. Good job. Awesome. Thank you so much. So now um, I'm going to kindly ask um, if you could unshare your screen and then we'll go right into the wrap-up presentation um, and talk a little bit about taking the post-shadowing assess assessment. So, so can everyone see my screen? Okay, awesome. Yep. So um, thank you guys so much for um, 
sticking around for this wonderful presentation. I think we all learned a lot from our wonderful speaker. Um, and considering this, we would like to encourage everyone to reflect on the session today and answer quick questions either on your own or through the chat um, and consider what brought you to the session today. What are the three major takeaways that you got from this presentation? And what do you want to learn more about um, in the field of pharmacy or ph pharmacology? And then, oops. So this writing or reflection is not required. However, we encourage you to submit it to our website for publication for recognition of your hard work and to enhance future applications to graduate schools and beyond. And if you want to learn more about pre-health shadowing and get involved in our program, we encourage you to visit our website uh, where you could become um, an inc asynchronous volunteer to get certified hours through professional nominations, graphic designs, and social media promotions. We are also accepting team member applications if you want to take on a more active role in pre-health shadowing to lead projects, initiatives, um, to be here um, up with us on the screen. So once again, we are humbly asking that if you're um, a, um, if you're financially able to, to donate um, and please send a few dollars to us via Venmo or PayPal. It costs a lot to keep our program up and running and free to all of you. So if you are someone who can afford to, or if you know someone else who can, please support those who cannot by donating to our organization today so that everyone like you and I can continue to get the education that they deserve. Otherwise, we simply ask that you spread the word about our program pre-health shadowing to reach as many students as possible. So now for the part that we've all been waiting for, um, earning a digital certificate for the virtual shadowing hours from today's session. So for step one, you will want to go onto our website and to find our professionals course page. Um, and if you have any questions on finding this, please send uh, those in the chat. Um, so step two, uh, next you can take our quick 10 question multiple choice and true and false quiz based on the content from this session today you will have 30 minutes per attempt to earn a score of 70% or higher in order to get your certificate. We know that sometimes technology may be difficult. And for this reason, we allow two attempts to take the assessment. But if you run into any difficulties, please contact us directly. To ensure that our website does not crash from a high influx of students on it, uh, we recommend that you wait about 30 minutes up to an hour after today's session in order to take the quiz, which will be open indefinitely. So you can take it anytime after this session is over with. And for step three, once you have passed the quiz, you can click the finish course button um, at the bottom of the professionals page um, in order for you to download your certificate, verifying your virtual shadowing hours. So if you missed a part of today's session or want to go back and view other sessions to earn more certificates with verified virtual shadowing hours, you can go to our YouTube channel um, at Pre-Health Shadowing and watch our previous recordings. You can also find them via the professional pages on our website um, under the um, professional's course name. And you could also take the post shadowing assessment assessments for these as well, since all of our quizzes are open indefinitely. Be sure to follow us on social media or subscribe to our email list for the latest updates on upcoming sessions and events. We are currently booked every weekday through June for virtual shadowing sessions, so I hope to see you guys all there. 
hopefully every day of the week. And lastly, thank you all for joining us today. And please stick around if you have any questions. Uh, myself, as well as other team members in today's session, will be around to happily answer any questions that you may have from today's session or anything else free health shadowing related or not. So, um, sorry about that. So um, this shadowing session is officially over and I invite you all to log off and have a nice rest of your Wednesday evening.